online, welcome. So glad that you're able to join us. Just a couple quick announcements uh, before we get started. Most announcements are just in that little piece of paper that you'll see on uh, every other seat uh, there. But uh, again, welcome this morning. So thankful that everyone's uh, able to be here with us. Uh, if you would like to, uh, this morning, you can grab the black padded folder at the end of every single row, and uh, we would love to pray for you, however that might look. We pray over those prayer requests every single week, our elders and leaders uh, and staff pray over those, and we're just thankful that we have the opportunity to pray for you. So feel free to fill out uh, one of the request forms in there, and uh, let us know that you're here today. You can do that anytime during the week, of course, online at myharvestchurch.ca slash connect. You can go ahead and do that there. If you'd like to give today, you can do that. Um, here in the church, uh, there's uh, brown boxes at the back of the worship center and as well as on your way out of the door there. There's envelopes in those black padded folders as well as at the boxes. Again, you can do that online at myharvestchurch.ca slash give. Thank you so much for giving uh, here at Harvest Church. And then just uh, one other announcement that I know wasn't uh, in the little pamphlet. Uh, this coming, not this Sunday, today, but next Sunday, uh, we'll be having a Harvest Essentials, essentially an opportunity for you to learn more about the, the church and uh, how to get involved. The next step in plugging in to uh, leading, uh, whether that be a small group or uh, working for Harvest Kids or youth ministry or anything like that, but it's a great opportunity for you to learn more about our church. And uh, so there'll be lunch provided after the service. We'll, give, uh, we'll be sending out a few more details about that uh, throughout the week, so keep an eye on your emails. I'd uh, love to have you, love to have a few more people stepping up and uh, helping uh, serve here at Harvest. So, well, let's stand this morning. God is good. Let's sing to him. Sin is broken. There's a reason why the darkness runs from the light. There's a reason why we stand here now forgiven. Jesus is alive. Hope you believe that this morning, church. Come on, sing out. There's a reason why we are not overtaken. There's a reason. Why we sing on through the night. There's a reason why our hope remains eternal. Jesus is alive. Praise the King. Come on. Praise the King. He is risen. Praise the King. He's alive. Praise the King, death defeated, hallelujah, he's alive, oh, hallelujah, he's alive. There's a reason why our hearts can be courageous, there's a reason why the dead are made alive. Share this resurrection. Jesus is alive. Oh, he's alive. Come on. Praise the King. He is risen. Praise the King. He's alive. Praise
They could not ignore when all of heaven's roaring. How where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? The world cannot ignore when all the saints are roaring. How where is your victory? Death, where, come on, let's proclaim this church. Come on, the grave cannot ignore when all of heaven's roaring. Your victory, death, where is your sting? The world cannot ignore it. And all of us are over it. And tell where it's your victory, death, where is your sting? Yeah. Praise the King, He is risen. Praise the He's alive. Praise the King. Death defeated. Hallelujah. He's alive. Oh, oh, oh. Hallelujah. He's alive in this place now. And hallelujah. He's alive. Amen. Amen. He's alive, church. Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee, all the faults of sin, I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior, art Thou. If ever I love Thee, my Jesus, tis now. Amen. 
love you in death with every beat of mine, with every breath. I'll love you in life. I'll love you in death with every beat of mine, with every. just sung would be true, that we could say that in our hearts, that we love you in life, we love you in death, with every beat of our heart, with every single one of our breaths. God, thank you. Thank you for your son, Jesus, who died on the cross and rose again, Lord. Thank you for the time that you're able to give us this morning your word. Lord, would you teach us? Would we remember daily who you are in our lives? Would we seek to live out a life honoring to your son, to you, O oh Lord? And it's in your son's name we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You want me to take your seats um, over the course of the next um, few weeks, months? As we finish up our series or continue our series and be the church, uh, every week we want to have someone, uh, one of our members come up and share their testimony with you. So this morning, uh, it will be uh, Susan Boyce, so thanks for coming, Susan. And uh, just uh, to let you know, we're going to ask a few more people to come up and share their testimony over the coming weeks. So, Susan, go ahead. Good morning. My name is Susan Boyce. When I was in kindergarten, a neighbor took my sister, my brother, and I to a local United Church. Soon my mom was going to church and we attended most Sundays until I got to high school. In high school I got a job working at a riding stable. My passion was horses. Everything I did was horses. My job, my friends, all my activities. I competed in horse shows, taught riding lessons, and I would even say that my identity was found in horses. My husband John and I even met at a riding stable we both worked at. After being married and expecting our first daughter, I prayed that I would seek out a church for our young family. John and I found a community church to attend a couple of months later. I joined the women's ministry and I took a class during the day that was led by two older ladies. This is where I learned who Jesus was, or Jesus is, and what he had done for me. And I learned that I was a sinner in need of a savior. In 2002, I surrendered my life to Christ and I was baptized. At first, I would pick up my Bible with every intention of reading, but most of it didn't make sense. I would hear Christianese terms in church and didn't fully understand what they meant. But God was faithful, and he continued to draw me in. Over the next few years, I attended women's ministry meetings, I volunteered in children's ministry, and I was a part of a small group. Slowly, through my many intentional relationships, serving at church and attending regularly, my knowledge was growing. At our previous church, small groups were designed so that there was intentional, accountable discipleship. Here I learned more knowledge, but more importantly, I learned that none of the knowledge was good unless it transformed my heart. I learned that God had given me, or, sorry, I had learned that God had forgiven me, but now I had to forgive myself. I had to let go of my past. Horses was something I now participated in, but my identity was found in Christ. The anxiety I suffered from in my teens and 20s melted away as I leaned into God and who he is and his promises. 
Now, 20 plus years later, my desire is to meet with other ladies, to challenge them in their walk. Now I seek to know God on a personal level, and I allow him to convict my heart, and even though I make mistakes every day, I know that I am forgiven when I seek him and ask for his forgiveness. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Hey, why don't we, uh, why don't we just pray? I want to pray and thank the Lord for, uh, for what he's done in the life of Susan, of Sue there, and for her sharing her testimony this morning. And as we get into God's word this morning, what a great way to open up our service. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for who you are. <clears throat> God, thank you that you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords, that you are alive and well, that you are resurrected, that you are seated at the right hand of God. And Lord, that you have poured out your spirit and you are drawing people to yourself. Lord, thank you for the living testimony that Susan is to that this morning, sharing her faith, Lord, of how you convicted her, how you've drawn her in, Lord, even the encouragement, Lord, that that should be for each and every one of us, Lord, that as we open up your word this morning, your desire is to grow us in the gospel, Lord, to teach us that we would grow on our faith, that we would work it out in fear and trembling, that we would begin to understand and be transformed from one degree of glory into the next, into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you that you are and continuing to do that in Susan's life. Lord, thank you that you were doing it amongst our church and many of us here this morning. And Lord, we pray for more of that. Lord, we pray expectantly and excitingly, Lord, that as we have looked even already in this series, Lord, that you have promised that you are building your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That you have promised that, Lord, and your word tells us that all the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we thank you this morning that we can come with anticipation, Lord, that we can come with, Lord, we come with humble hearts knowing that we need your word, Lord, we need your spirit uh, to reveal it to us, to draw us to it, Lord, to draw us to yourself. And so, Lord, we pray for that this morning right now, that your spirit would be poured out on this place, Lord, that you would convict people who are in need of a Savior, Lord, that you would affirm and encourage us and continue us who, are, uh, who do know you, Lord, in our faith and what it looks like to walk in repentance and what it looks like to honor you as our Lord and Savior. And I pray all these things in your name this morning. Amen. 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 Are we here this morning? We're awake, we're alive, you're a, little, uh, you're a little quiet on me. You guys are ready, ready to get into God's Word together? Awesome, great, I am too. Why don't you go ahead and uh, jump uh, and gr- grab a Bible this morning if you need to. Uh, go ahead and do that. Uh, there are Bibles at the back. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, you feel free to uh, help yourself to one of those. You can keep that, that's our gift to you. We are going to be in Acts 2 uh, this morning. Acts chapter 2 is where we're going to be. Uh, we're going to kind of get to do what I did with you last week. Uh, we're into the third week of our series looking at We the Church, and we started off in Matthew 16. And then we, start, we jumped across to Acts 2 uh, last week, but part of that, we kind of, we jumped back to saying, well, let's look at the text that we start off with, Matthew 16, and then we got into Acts 2, and now I'm kind of going to do that again. We're going to jump back to almost what we looked at last week, Acts 2, as we continue our progression looking at who the church is. What do we mean when we say we the church? What we're going to see this morning is that we the church, what we've seen is that we the church are a believing people. We, the church, are a preaching people. Preaching is, is, it has to be a priority in, in the, with the people of God and in his church. And we're going to see this morning now that we are an identified people. You know, when I was on vacation this summer, just back in, a, back in August, I was walking around some stores, just killing some time. Millie was doing a few things with, uh, with Sailor, our daughter. So I had her son, Jasper, and we were walking around one of those big Canadian tire stores up north. And I uh, took him down the toy aisles, and it's always, it's always fascinating to see how the toy industry uh, works. Just about every toy on that shelf uh, that we walk past and that Jasper's eyes light up at or he wants to stop and see, they're all based around little TV shows and, and other things that they watch on TV. We limit his show time and his TV time quite a lot, but even just the little things that he's exposed to, he sees a toy on the shelf or he sees a costume or a hat or something that he can put on, he's like, wow, wow, he, he, he wants to get that and he wants to put it on, he wants to associate with it. And so we were going down the aisles and we got past Dora the Explorer and Peppa Pig and Octonauts and Paw Patrol and Chico Bomb Bomb and Thomas the Tank Engine and everything in between, and if you're gloriously unaware of what I'm talking about at the moment, just consider yourself blessed. You're more blessed than you know. But listen, kids love this stuff. Why? Because it's a way for them to identify with what they've seen and heard. It's one thing to watch the show on TV. It's another to step up and wear the costume and go all in and go about your house or go to your friend's house and be like, I'm all in. This is who I am. This is what I'm about. You know, as we went down those toy aisles, it brought me back to when I was a kid, and we used to play cops and robbers long before Paw Patrol existed. 
And sure enough, they were, actually when we were going down, I guess the classics never really die. There was this perfect little uh, Cops and Robbers set, just like the one that I would have played with when I grew up. Basically, it's the, if you're the cop, you get the little sheriff badge, you can clip it on, and you have a little handgun. And then there's also the robber outfit, so he's got the mask, and he's got like the double barrel shotgun. Like, my money's on the robber if anything actually goes down. But I used to like to be the cop. I used to clip the little badge on, and it said, you know, serve, protect, defend, and you would run around, and you, that was your identity. It, there was just something powerful and meaningful to that, that to be able to clip something on you and say, that's who I am. It affirmed for me my identity in that moment, even if it was just make-believe at that time. You know, there's something powerful about bringing an invisible identity into a visible, tangible reality that we can identify with. And it's not only wanted at times, maybe in the life of our kids, but I would say this, it's also needed at times. Often it's essential and needed as we grow up, as we are out in society, that people have a way of signifying who they are and what they do. You think about OPP and paramedics and firefighters, they all wear uniforms. Go into the hospital, nurses have ID badges. Even go to, to order your food, McDonald's, Tim Hortons, DQ, they all have their own colors and uniforms. Retail stores have the way of identifying their associates so you know who, who's working and who's on and who you can ask questions to. Sports teams have their own jer jerseys, all, all created to identify people. There are times where it's important to identify who someone is and what they're doing. And I hope we could all agree with that statement that there are times that it's important to identify who someone is and what they're doing. And as we get into God's word this morning, here's why I say all of that. What we're going to see this morning is that God thinks so too. God thinks that it is important for us to be able to identify as a church. When it comes to the church, who the church is and who identifies with the church is important to God. And God has given his church, for each person in his church, a means to identify who they are and what they are doing. That is to proclaim who or what their identity is. And the way that God does this is not by wearing a shirt. It's not by getting a tattoo. It's not even by sticking a fish badge on your car. It's not a knock if, if you've done any of those things. The way in which God has ordained this to be done is by two sacraments or two ordinances. Those are two things that are ordained by God. That's what, sometimes why we call them ordinances. One is we're going to look this morning, we're going to spend the next couple of weeks looking at these ordinances. So this morning we're going to look at what baptism is. Why does the Lord instruct baptism? And then the second ordinance that we see commanded in Scripture is the Lord's Supper or communion. And so we're going to take a week to look and study that as well. As we do that, as we kick off this morning, I want to, I want to stress this to you. There are only two sacraments that are given and instructed by God. That is taught by Jesus Christ himself through Scripture. Two sacraments, two ordinances that we see given to us as believers in Jesus Christ to carry out. And I want to stress that this morning because maybe you've had a different upbringing in church. For example, maybe some of you have been raised in the Roman Catholic Church and they practice seven sacraments. Yet if you truly search and study God's word, you'll see that Jesus Christ instructed his church to carry out two acts of identification with him. And so as I said, these methods are through baptism and through the Lord's Supper. And so the reason I want to look at ordinances with you now in this church series as we continue to progress through our study of what is the church, who are we, the church, is that, that this is the very next thing that we see clearly happening in the church from where we left off last week. Like I said, week one, we've seen that the church is a believing people. In Matthew 16, that's where we started off. Jesus looked at his disciples and said, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And some of them said, well, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah. But then he looked at Simon Peter and he said, but who do you say that I am? And we looked at that and what was Simon Peter's confession? He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. He said, you are the Christ, that is Christos in the original language. It means you are the Messiah, you are the chosen one, you are the, you are the only one. That is what Peter is confessing in that moment, that Jesus Christ is the only person, the only way, the only way that we can be reconciled to God. Jesus Christ himself said that. He said that he was the way, he's the truth, he's the life. And that nobody can come to the Father except through him. And the reason that is, is because all of us, the gospel tells us that all of us have sinned. That all of us are separated from God. That all of us have this problem of sin that we cannot be reconciled to a holy, righteous God. That means a God who will rightfully punish sin. And we have all sinned. And so this is why Jesus Christ is the only person that can take care of our sin, that can reconcile us to God. Because he was the only person to come. And the Bible tells us in him there was no sin. 
He was righteous. He was pure. He was holy. That is why John the Baptist, when he seen Jesus coming, he said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold the sacrifice of God because Jesus Christ was the holy, righteous one, the Lamb of God who could take our sin, that could deal with the problem that we all have that nobody else can deal with, that no amount of money can deal with, that no amount of family can deal with, and that not even your spouse can deal with. The gospel is that our sin separates us from God, but blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ because he has given us a living hope. That is through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So that is what we've looked at. That's what we started, that the church is a believing people because as Peter announced that and made that proclamation, Jesus looked at him and he said, he said, you're blessed. You're so blessed, Peter. And he said, on that confession, Peter, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so we've seen that the church is a believing people, and then what we see next was that the church was a preaching people. John the Baptist had went out and was preparing the way of the Lord, and then what we looked at last week was what some of what we study is we've seen that Jesus was the, the Word of God. John 1 tells us that. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And then John 1.14 tells us that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That is, that Jesus Christ, the Word of God, took on flesh and then what we've seen and what we studied last week, we've seen part of that is that we've seen the word of God and then Jesus comes and Jesus is baptized. And what happens in that moment is it says that the spirit of God descended like a dove and came and rested upon Jesus. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. And so we've seen the word of God matched with the spirit of God. And it's there then that we see the transformative power of God goes out because what happens then in Luke 4 is that Jesus begins his ministry. Jesus begins his ministry and what does he go about doing? Well, this is what we looked at last week. Jesus was a preacher. It said he began to go out and he began to proclaim. He began to preach the good news of the gospel. And what Jesus began to preach was repent. Repent of your sin for the kingdom of God is at hand. Turn away from your sin. Turn away from your own self-idolatry and what you're living for and turn to God. Find, uh, uh, repent and t- find grace in the Lord Jesus Christ and who he was. And so we've seen that Jesus was a preacher and and then as he, as he is, before he is uh, crucified and, and he is raised to life again, what does he do? He commissions his disciples to go out and to build a church. And how were they to build a church? How was Jesus Christ going to build his church? By doing this, by commissioning the disciples, the apostles. He said, wait for the Holy Spirit to come. I'm going to send the helper. And when you've received the helper, then he commissions them. And he says, you're going to go out and you're going to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to take my word and match it with my spirit, and I'm going to draw lost, sinful, broken people to myself. And that is who the church is. And so this is where we finished last week. We've seen the most powerful, arguably the most powerful, impactful sermon ever to be preached, the first sermon off the church found in Acts chapter 2. Peter stands up full of the spirit, and he starts to proclaim the good news of the gospel. So let's read a little bit of this as we start this morning. Acts 2, 21 to 24, it said this, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This was Peter's sermon. This was Peter's sermon to the people who had part, a large part of that crowd who had been part of yelling out, crucify him, crucify him, and rejecting Jesus. Peter stands up and he says, man of Israel, in verse 22, Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed him by the hands of lawless men. But this is what we've just been singing about. This is why we are here and this is why we can worship this morning because God raised him up, losing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. And this is just a snippet and part of the sermon. This is where, our, uh, this is where the good news of the gospel is, is proclaimed. And then what we see now is what we want to focus on this morning is verses 37 to 41. Because what we see next is as, as Peter delivers this good news of the gospel, people receive the gospel and what are they instructed to do? In verse 37, it says uh, they, they looked at, at Peter and the, and the apostles and they said, brothers, what shall we do? They were convicted of their deep need for Jesus Christ. And in verse 37, it says, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter then turns to them and says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He says, This promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And it says, with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his words were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. 
This is exactly what Peter and the disciples had been commissioned to go and do to preach this good news of the gospel. We've seen it in Matthew 28. This is when Jesus commissioned his disciples. What did he tell them to do? He said, therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. Declare this good news throughout the whole world because it's available for the whole world and God has promised that he will draw all nations to himself. And, how, and as these people are drawn to themselves, what does Jesus commission his disciples to do? He says, go and make disciples. And he says, baptize them. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit right here. And so this is what the disciples set out to do. And so this is what we see. The Lord calls us to bring our hearts before him, to confess our sin to him, to confess him as our Lord and Savior. These are matters of the heart. These are matters of your heart. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you truly believe that? Is your life or your actions, is your heart really under the Lordship of Jesus Christ? I don't know as I look out at you this morning. I don't know where you're at. Nobody else really knows where you're at. Maybe your spouse or maybe even your, some of your family don't know where you're at because you can put on a good front to that. It's something that's invisible if it's really there. But listen, as we do that, as we truly come to faith in Jesus Christ, the first commandment that we're given, that we're charged with, is then to visibly identify with Christ. That is to outwardly proclaim the inward reality that's really happened in our lives, to make it visible. And so our first point as we look at baptism this morning is this, is that baptism is an act of obedience. This is a commandment of the Lord Jesus Christ to every single believer. This is the, I'd say this, this is the first commandment of obedience that the Lord Jesus Christ gives every believer. As we are called to him, as we are called to confess our sin, to accept him as Lord and Savior, the very first thing, if that is true reality in our lives, the very first thing that Christ asks of us is to outwardly and publicly proclaim our faith through baptism, to visually and publicly identify with him. So I'll say this, baptism is the way in which all true believers of Christ truly identify that they are saved by Christ. Let's be really clear here. Baptism does not save us. The act of baptism does not make us a true follower of Christ. Baptism is not your ticket that, you know, you do or don't have salvation if you were or were not baptized. But baptism is an outward act of obedience to Christ that proclaims you have been saved through what? Through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift from God. It's not by your works. It's not by your earning. It's not by doing or going through some sort of ritual or tradition at church that you've earned it. No, it's the grace of God in your life. And listen, as we do that, if you are baptized as a believer in Jesus Christ, just as I used to clip on that, that little badge as a kid to, 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 as a way of proclaiming that I was, you know, an officer at that point, that little badge, I can picture it, it, used to, it said serve, protect, defend on it. That was like the little slogan it had. Baptism is an identification for you, for us as Christ followers to say we're truly following Christ. It's a declaration. That's our second point this morning is this baptism. It's an act of obedience, but it's also an act of declaration. It's declaring something. What does declaration mean? Well, here's the definition of declaration. It is the formal announcement of the beginning of a state or condition. That is what it means to declare something. And so just like that little, if I had to make up a slogan for what baptism is, just like that little badge on, on, on my uniform used to say, serve, protect, defend. Here's really, uh, if I had to sum up what baptism is, this is what we're going to look at now this morning, is this, as we are baptized, we're saying that we're dead, that we were dead, we're dying, and we're reborn. That's what baptism is really symbolizing. That's what it's really all about. If you had to sum it up in three words, I'd say dead, dying, and reborn. Let's unpack that. The first thing that baptism symbolizes is death. The word in the original language in the Greek, baptizo, in the, it means to plunge, to dip, to immerse. So as we talk about baptism, we're talking about someone being plunged into water. That is why, as a church, we practice baptism. We, we fully immerse people in water. It's that symbolism. Here's the thing. When somebody goes underwater and doesn't come back up, what happens? They drown. They die. You can't breathe. Their bodies recovered and they're buried. Why? Because they died. And so as someone is, is, is plunged under the waters of baptism, part of that proclamation, part of that declaration is you're declaring that by yourself you're dead in your trespasses and sins. Baptism is firstly signifying death. That's what Ephesians 2, 1 tells us. It says we are dead in our trespasses and sins. 
But not only that, I'd say this, the water of baptism has an even richer symbolism than simply symbolizing the grave. The water of baptism points directly to God's judgment that comes upon unbelievers. You see, at various points in the Bible, God's judgment came in the form of a flood against the unbelievers in Genesis 7. It was God's judgment that came against Pharaoh and the Egyptians as Pharaoh hardened his heart against the Lord. You can read about that in Exodus 14. God wiped them out with water. Jonah even was thrown into the depths of the ocean because of his disobedience against God and then graciously and miraculously spared and brought up onto the shore as a sign of the resurrection. And so baptism, our confession as Christians, is that we should rightfully fall under the judgment of God, that we've all sinned and God is so holy and God takes sin so seriously that it is rightfully punished by death. That's what Romans 6.23 tells us. It tells us that the wages, the earnings of our sin is death. Listen, that is why we have to confess Jesus as the Christ, as our Savior, as our Messiah, because without him, we are dead. We are spiritually bankrupt. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. And this is why Jesus came, to forgive us our sins. This is our greatest need. This is what Christ has met for us through his death, through his substitutionary atonement, through his payment for our sins on the cross and being raised to life. This is what Peter preached back in our passage this morning, Acts 2, look at 38. It says, Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the forgiveness of your sins. This is your greatest need this morning. No matter what is causing you anxiety or difficulty or worry in your life or what you think you need to get sorted out in your life, listen, the greatest need for all of us is to be forgiven from our sins. And so just as Christ died for us, we are to associate with his death. Then listen, this is the command. It says, repent and be baptized. So as we repent of our sins, what we're saying is, I, I, I don't want that dead life anymore. Repenting means to turn away. We're turning away from that sin that leads to death, that life, the old me. What we're saying is that old me is dead. The old me without Christ is dead when we come to faith in Jesus Christ. And so that's why baptism only doesn't, it doesn't symbolize death, but it also symbolizes, and it's also a proclamation that we as Christians, we were, were dead in our trespasses and sins, but now what we're practicing doing is we're practicing dying. We're practicing dying to ourselves, to our flesh, to our old way of life. And that's good news. That's a good path to be on. If the wages of your sin, if your old sinful life leads to the judgment of God, listen, in repentance, what we're saying is I'm dying to that life. I'm dying to that life that leads to death. I'm dying to that life that separates me from God. I'm practicing dying to my old way of life that leads to death. What we're proclaiming is the days of me living for my own lusts and passions and desires and wants and me being king of my life, that's dead to me. And that is why we're called to repentance. Listen, Romans 8, 13 says this. This is a warning that I believe some of us need to hear this morning. It says this, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Since some of us right now are living according to our flesh, we're rejecting who Jesus is. It's not that important to us. We'll sleep through the message. We'll sleep through the gospel. We've heard it too many times. Yeah, okay, maybe later, maybe once I've lived, however way I want to do. But listen, this is the warning of God. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But then there's this glorious invitation of good news. But if by the Spirit of God you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. This is life and death. This is what we sang this morning. I'll love you in life. I'll love you in death. Why? Because Jesus Christ does this. Whenever we give our lives to him, it says we're deemed holy, and God gives us his his Holy Spirit, and that's the power whereby, whereby we're able to put to death the deeds of the body. How many people say, I can't come to Christ because, you know, I got to get my life figured out, or if I made a profession of faith, or if I got baptized, then I might go back, and I might mess it up, and I might not live this perfect life, and so I'll just never do it, and I'll never follow Christ because I can't do it by myself. Absolutely, amen. You're actually getting part of the gospel. You won't do it by yourself. You will never be good enough by yourself. You will not be able to conquer sin by yourself. But the good news of the gospel is this is why the helper comes. This is why we're promised the Holy Spirit for every believer. The Holy Spirit is poured out. And it's by the power of the Holy Spirit that we die to our flesh. And it's by the Spirit that we're drawn in to love the commands of God 
and see them as our loving protection and our guide, and we meditate on His Word, and we love it. And as we do that, as we die to our, as we die to our flesh and live in the Spirit, listen, this is the life of a true believer that's, that's acknowledging Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and here's the good news of the gospel. You will live. You'll have eternal life. And this is what Jesus Christ calls us to. This is not optional. If you are a true believer in Jesus Christ, this is how you live your life. If you are truly justified, that is bought by the precious blood of Jesus, you will be sanctified. You will be made more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. You have to have a passion for that. You have to have a desire for that. that is a, those are the fruits of true saving faith. Jesus himself told his disciples in Matthew 16, just after that passage that we read again, as Peter declared him as the Christ, later on in Matthew 16, Jesus says this, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What's Jesus talking about? He's talking about dying to herself. He's talking about repentance. He's talking about, listen, if you're going to die to your old way of life, if you're going to lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. You'll find eternal life. If anyone would come after me, it says, let him deny himself. Let him die to himself. There is a cost to following Jesus Christ. The gospel is freely offered to all. It's a, it's a gift that we accept, but, but part of that, and Jesus Christ talks about the cost of discipleship, there is a cost. It's to deny ourselves. When the world says, that whatever you want to do, whoever you want to be, whatever you want to pursue, just go after that and, 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 and live it out and love for it. Listen, the call of the gospel is, no, we need to die to our flesh and live by the Spirit of God. And this is what Jesus Christ says. He says, take up. If you're going to follow Jesus Christ, you've got to take up your cross. You've got to take up your cross and follow Christ. Listen, when Jesus is talking about picking up your cross and following him, He's not talking about wearing a cross around your neck and continuing on with life as you want. When Jesus says that if you're a true Christ follower, you have to pick up your cross and follow me, he's not saying, well, find a pretty cross to hang in the rearview mirror of your car or find a beautiful one that you're going to put in the mantelpiece at home. Jesus here isn't talking about interior design or jewelry choices. It's not love it or list it. It kind of sounds like I'm joking, right? But it, listen, this is what many people reduce the cross to in their lives. Perhaps that's the place, that's really the place that the, the cross has in your life. Perhaps that actually accurately describes the place of the cross in your life at the moment. Does the cross have a place in your home or around your neck while instead of living for Christ, you live for yourself? Who is the king of your life? Who is the Lord of your life? What is the source of your happiness? Where do you find greatest importance and therefore what do you labor the most to achieve or protect? What do you invest your time and your money and your efforts and your thought into? What's most important to you? Is it your job? Is it your bank account? Is it your image? For some people it's your reputation. Perhaps it's a whole mix of those things. Perhaps it is that your sense of value that's found in other people is your Lord, therefore it's dependent upon other people. Perhaps what's lording over you in your life is your unquenchable need to satisfy your lusts, your desires, your addictions, your need for control and safety or certainty. So the question we have to ask ourselves and challenge us with is this, how is your life today radically different because you've chosen to die to yourself and live for Christ? I want you to think about that this morning. If you are a true Christ follower, if you're evaluating yourself, am I really following Christ? How is your life today radically different because you've chosen to die to yourself and follow Christ? It should be. It should be different. Because the Bible tells me that my heart is deceitful above all things and it's desperately wicked. It says, who can know it? It's saying, I, I don't even know. We are not even aware of the depths of depravity of our own heart and where it leads us to and what idols that we're going to chase after. So left to myself, that is where I will go as a man. And so that is why each and every day we are called to repent, to live this out each and every day. Each and every day I get up, each and every day you get up as a Christ follower, we have to decide, are we going to let the Lord be the Lord of our lives? Are we going to practice dying to ourselves daily, repenting, walking out obedience with Christ?
Listen, the older in your faith you get, the more obvious that question should be to answer. Listen, that command that's given by Jesus, it's in the midst of the Roman Empire, where the cross was the most brutal, terrible, inescapable method of dying. If you were judged to pick up your cross, there was only one thing that was happening to you. If somebody seen somebody walking through the streets with a cross laden on their back, they had picked up their cross, there was no escaping the fact that you would look at that man or that woman and say, they are on their way to die. And the stakes couldn't be any higher. And Peter declares to the people through the sermon in Acts 2 that we are to repent and be baptized. And so listen, Christ's invitation to us is to come and to die, but it's to come and to die so that we might live. That is the reality of the gospel. We are dead in our trespasses and sins, so Jesus says repent of that way and, and practice dying to yourselves. Die to yourself so that you may live when you come to me. Romans 6, 4 says this, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we, might, we too might walk in newness of life. So we see what baptism symbolizes. It symbolizes that we are dead in our sins. It symbolizes that what we are declaring is that we are going to practice a life dying to ourselves and walking out in repentance. And here's the last thing that it symbolizes. It symbolizes that we are reborn. I love this reality. Come and die to your sin for which God will judge you. Come and repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we do that, we are promised, we are given this rebirth, a spiritual rebirth. In John 14, when Jesus promised the Holy Spirit, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he'll give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him. Again, we're dead to the spiritual things of God until he reveals it to us. But it says, why do we know God? You know God. You know him. Why? Because he dwells with you and will be in you. This is the promise that we are given as we come to Christ, that we are spiritually reborn. We receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. This is what it means to be born again. And this is what Peter again proclaims in Acts 2. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And then what does he say? He says, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He says, you will be born again by the Spirit. I love in John 3, remember the passage of Nicodemus? Where he looks at Jesus and he says, what do you mean be born again? What is that about? I hear, I hear you talking about being born again. How can I be born again? Do I, do I like enter my mother's womb? Am I born again? Like, what are you talking about, this physical birth? And Jesus says, no, no, no. What's off the flesh is, is flesh. But he says, you must be, you must be born again. It means you must be uh, born of the spirit and of water. And he says, unless you're born of the spirit, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. He says, you need a spiritual birth. And I love the reality and the image of that. That is, if you truly come and accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that the Bible tells us that we are adopted into the family of God. We are declared children of God. It says we're children of God, and so we are. And we are sealed, we are promised with that. Ephesians 1.13, it says this, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed in him, you were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. I love that. You know, the reality that that means for us is that God does not reject or abandon his children. That whenever we come to a true saving faith in Jesus Christ, we are sealed eternally by the promise of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't come from us and doesn't go from us and we were the children of God and then we're not. No, no, no. We're declared children of God through our true belief in Jesus Christ. We're sealed by the promise of his Holy Spirit. And I love the, the affirmation of what that means for us as true children of God. I love the identity that we can truly be found in Christ. I love the reality of the gospel that that speaks over us when you have this image of new birth. You know, in our house right now, we're awaiting the, the birth of, our, of the latest member of our family, what's going to be our third ch uh, child. We are very excited for that. Birth is an absolute miracle. It's going to happen very soon. I actually I texted John and Chris just late last night, and they said, it might be happening. Have plan B, ready to go. I may, I may not be here this morning, okay? So it's, it's going to happen very soon. Amelia's at home right now. But listen, when we, when we 
when Amelia gave birth to Jasper and to Sailor, listen, I'm not a crier, but when Jasper was born and he entered this world helpless and defenseless and naked and unashamed, as soon as that was birthed, I was just a, a, a sense of pure love and joy and happiness. And it was the same for her daughter. And I'm just like weeping and crying like a little girl as they're born. I can't wait to hold them and hug them and embrace them and, 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 and train them up and teach them and raise them and all of life that is before them. Listen, as that was happening, as those births were happening, as our new little baby is going to be welcomed into this world, I didn't stand off to Amelia's side and tell the nurse, well, you know, have a look at them. Make sure and inspect the baby well first because I may or may not decide to keep it. Right? When they were born, there was no scores I had to settle with them. There was no wrong that had been committed. There was nothing I needed to say. I was like, okay, well, finally you're into the world. Now let, let, me, let me tell you about a few things that I've, a few grudges I need to have against you that we got to get figured out here. As a father, the first time I got to hold them, I, I didn't hold them and then whisper in their ear, listen, there's a few conditions that you need to meet. I didn't say, you know what? I, I love you. You're perfect right now. But if you throw up, Or if you get a snotty nose, or if you poop in that diaper again, listen, like, that's it, we're done. It's laughable, it's unthinkable, right? Of course I would never do that. There isn't this tension that as long as my kids are perfect, I'll be their father. And if they're not, I'll abandon them. Or, 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 you know, if they feel like they aren't good enough for me, then, then my love will have changed for them. Listen, in our home, there's grace for mistakes, There's grace in the daily training up of our kids where sometimes as a parent, if you're a parent, I don't know about you, but Amelia and I just look at it and it's like, do you not just feel you're saying the same thing over and over and over again? Like like some of it just does, like some of it sticks, but some of it just seems to never stick and your life is this day by day battle of telling them again, like share properly, look after this, like don't hurt your sister, like look after that. And there's this daily training up. But listen, for our kids, there's no insecurity there that we love them. And there's grace and there's mercy and there's persistent training and affirmation and even, yes, loving discipline in that. And I say all of that analogy is to say this. The Bible tells us that we are born into the family of God, that we are children of God, and that relationship changes that he is our heavenly father. That God is our father, that we don't see God just as, uh, we don't see God as our judge We see him as our heavenly father. That's how Jesus told his disciples to pray. Pray like this. Pray our father. And you laugh at what I say to be like, well, of course I wouldn't say to my kids, well, if you mess up, I'm not going to love you or I'm going to abandon you or or, or we're out of step and all. But listen, I know there are a number of you here this morning and you continually struggle with this. This is what hinders your relationship with God. And I know that because you've told me so. And I also know it because I think at times there's almost, this is a battle that all of us as believers have wrestled with, that we feel like this is how God sees us, that we're not good enough for God, that yes, okay, we we accepted Jesus Christ and he paid for our sins, but somehow we still have to earn it. Somehow it's still dependent on us. Listen, to be born again is a fresh start. It's a new beginning. There's no baggage. There's no unspoken of sin that's not really been forgiven. There's not a tension that as long as things are going well, then I guess we can be God's children. But if we aren't performing well, we'll be out. The Bible tells us we're clothed in robes of righteousness. We are children of the king. We are adopted into God's family. And there's no condemnation in that for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. That's the powerful working of God. That is the reality of our faith. And listen, as we stumble, as we sin, as we get things wrong, that means that it just, we don't try to sweep it onto the rug. It means that we come to our Heavenly Father and we repent of those things and we confess those things and we move forward in love and grace and mercy, knowing with confidence that God is who He says He is, that He's our Heavenly Father and that we can walk in the truth and the freedom of the gospel. And that's a beautiful reality that many of us need to hear time and time again. You know, Acts 2, we looked at last week, read it again. It says at the end of the passage that about 3,000 souls were saved that day. I don't know about you, but when I read that, you could read it on the surface and say, that's a lawfully claim to make. So Peter delivers this awesome sermon, and there must have been thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people there. It says 3,000 people gave their life to Christ, so there had to be, was there six? Were there 10,000 people? A huge crowd there. 
whoever writes this down, do they look out at the crowd and do they say, eh, probably about half of the people accepted Christ today. Let's say 3,000 people gave their souls to the Lord. No, of course they didn't. How are they able to know? How does God's Word tell us? How are we able to see this as a historical fact, even written down and recorded, that there were 3,000 people that gave their lives to the Lord? Well, it tells us why, because it says that those who received His Word were baptized. Verse 41, a visible reality, a tangible reality to see, wow, this is how many people profess their saving faith in Jesus Christ, and they went and they were baptized, and that is why we were able to see and, and say, wow, these are the people that have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So this is why what baptism is, it signifies those of us who are true believers of Jesus Christ. And so if you are claiming to be a believer in Jesus Christ, listen, the first act of obedience that Christ calls you to is to be baptized, is to proclaim this, is to put a visible reality, to to put a visible proclamation to the invisible reality that's happened in your life. You know, I had someone who came to our church for a while, a couple of years ago, and they said they wanted to become a member of our church, and so I went out for coffee with him, and I asked him to share his testimony with me. And he said, well, you know, I was, I was born in the church, and I was raised in the church, and I always find that funny. And I was like, okay, let's not go, go too literal. I was like, were you actually born in the church? You were raised in the church? Like, some people's testimony sounds like a church hostage situation. It was like, were you allowed to leave? I know what he meant. I didn't go too literal, right? So it was like, okay, I was born in the church. I was raised in the church. I had Christian family and all of these wonderful things. And that would be my testimony, too, and praise God for that. And so I said to him, okay, so how, like, when, when did you come to know Christ then? Like, when were you baptized? And he said, well, I've never been baptized. I, I, and before I asked him another question, he said, I, I, I don't, he was like, baptism, I, I was born in the church, I was raised in the church, and he was like, I've made my profession in Jesus Christ, and, and, and the church seems to make this big, this big deal out of baptism. And I never got the, this idea of, you know, why this is such a powerful statement and this has to be your testimony that you get up and you're baptized. And he was like, my testimony is at work when I share my faith with other people and, and how I live my life and how I conduct my business. And that's how I testify and that's how I glorify Jesus Christ. That is my testimony. I don't understand so I, what the big deal with baptism is. So, so I've never been baptized, but I want to become a member of your church. And so with grace, I said to him, listen, I would love for you to be a member of our church. But I would be very nervous and feel wrong to identify you as a member of the church whenever you refuse. How do we identify you as a person in Jesus Christ when you refuse to do the very thing that Jesus Christ calls you to, to identify as a believer of Christ? It was a really awkward coffee after that. And he didn't come back. But this is the reality. And this is sometimes what people wrestle and battle with. And maybe you're like, well, what's the big deal with baptism? Listen, it's a commandment of God. It's a commandment of Scripture for our good, for our benefit, for our affirming, for the witness and the belief of other people. So perhaps you're wrestling, perhaps you're battling, perhaps you would say you have a faith in Jesus Christ, but you've never actually been baptized. And you're like, what do I do about that? Listen, we would love as a church to help you to walk in obedience with the Lord. Come and talk to us. We would love to hear your testimony, to, 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 to see and to hear what the Lord has truly done in your life, because like we said, baptism doesn't save you, but it's a proclamation that you have been saved, and so if you're hearing this and you're like, man, I, I actually do need to be baptized, then great, we would love to baptize you. A couple of things as we close this morning really quickly. For all the reasons we've talked about today, this is why as a church we practice and we only practice what's known as believer's baptism. Maybe you're saying, well, I was baptized as a kid or I, my, I, my parents told me I was baptized as a baby or what's with that. Listen, the Catholic Church proclaims that baptism is necessary for salvation. That's why it's administered to infants, to babies. They believe that the act of baptism causes regeneration. They would teach that that is the, the church's means of bestowing grace a saving grace upon people. Listen, there's only one person that can bestow saving grace upon you, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Not the church, not me, not us, not doesn't matter how many people come to our church. So that's one reason why we don't practice infant baptism for that reason, but there's another important distinction to make because there are many other Protestant churches, if you want to put a label on it, that practice infant baptism. 
and it's important, it's important to make a distinction here. This is by no means them saying that baptism saves children. They would, they would profess that and say that a lot of churches, even as they administer infant baptism. The reason some churches practice infant baptism is because they believe, there's two things at the heart of the argument. I'm going to go super quick because we're out of time. They believe that circumcision was the outward marker of the Old Testament. Yeah, that, that was how God declared his covenant with, with Israel, and, and, and circumcision was the outward marker for that, for that invisible reality. And so what they would say is circumcision in the Old Testament and baptism in the New Testament is the same. It equates with each other. They would even point to Colossians 2, and it says this. Well, does Paul not say the same thing? Colossians 2.11 says this. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, when, which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. He's saying, there it is. Is Paul not saying that circumcision and baptism are the same things? Another reasoning for infant baptism is it says that if, when you read the accounts of Acts, this book of Acts that we're looking at, in Acts 16, it talks about households being baptized. You see it in Corinthians as well. There's a few references here I have on the screen. In Acts 16, 15, it, tell, it tells you that the household of Lydia was baptized as she came to faith. In Acts 16, 33, it says the household of the Philippian or the Philippian jailer, as he comes to Christ, it says he was baptized, him and his whole household. And it talks about the household of Stephanus in 1 Corinthians in the church. It says that these households were baptized. And so people look at that as Scripture and say, well, clearly he must have came to faith or she must have came to faith, and then they baptized all of their children in their house. So I'll say this, it is certainly true that baptism and circumcision are in many ways similar as to what they represent. That is, they're a visible marker of God's people and identified people. However, we can't forget that there's also some really important differences. The old covenant, that is, with the Jews, they had a physical and external means of entrance into the covenant community. Circumcision was not the mark of truly spiritually alive people. Every single person in Israel in the Old Testament church, God commanded them to circumcise every single male, even if it was slaves brought in, whoever it was at eight days old, he said circumcise them. It was a marker of that covenant community. But then Paul in Romans 9, 6, when he talks about this community, it says this. It says, is it, is it as though the word of God has failed? He says this, not all who are descended from Israel truly belong to Israel. He's saying even though they were marked as covenant community, clearly not all of them had a true saving faith in God. He goes on in verse 8 and he says, this means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise that are counted as offspring. He's saying it's not physical flesh, it's spiritual promise. So it's true that baptism is a sign of people's entrance into the church Listen, people enter into the church and are redeemed, and that's a spiritual reality that's given by a spiritual choice that cannot be made by a one-year-old or a two-year-old or a three-year-old, but comes by you bringing your heart before the Lord, and it's your declaration to say, this is where I am before the Lord, and so that is why we practice believer's baptism. What about the household thing? Well, when you actually look at all of those references that I shared with you there in Acts 16, it says he took them the same hour of the night, this is the Philippian jailer, he washed their wounds and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. The two verses before that though, it says this, this is what Paul declared to him, he said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household, and it says this, they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. So clearly that would suggest and that would show that if they are preaching the word of the Lord and they're sharing the word of the Lord to everybody who was in his house, then they were clearly old enough to receive and to understand the word of the Lord. I'm not going into somebody's house to preach a sermon or to share the good news of the gospel with a little baby in their crib that is crying and doesn't understand it. But I'll sure sit down to a four-year-old and explain the basic principles of the gospel and trust that the Spirit of God can work in their heart and bring them to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. I gave my life to Christ as a four-year-old child hearing the good news of the gospel. God can do that. And it's the same in all of those other places. When it talks about households of faith, it talks about how they went on and how they served the Lord and how they labored and how the word of the Lord was declared to all of them. 
as we're closing with this this morning as we get ready to worship. Ephesians 4, 6 says this. There is one body and one spirit. It says, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Listen, as the church of Jesus Christ, this is our testimony. This is our declaration that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. But God has revealed himself to us by the power of his spirit, by the preaching of his word, and we have repented of our sins. We have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord, and for that reason, we are now practicing dying to ourselves. And we die to ourselves because we've been spiritually reborn. And that is the awesome, wonderful, life-saving truth of the gospel. That is why the church is called to be an identified people, a baptized people. I hope and I pray that that is true for each and every one of us today. As I said before, if you have questions about this, if you're wondering about it, if I've said something even today that you're not sure of, or maybe the Lord's just convicting you on something, whether it's about baptism or what, whether what, maybe what it looks like to walk out in faith this morning to say, I'm practicing dying to myself. Maybe there's a sin that you're struggling with and it's gripped your life and it's been convicting you for so long. Listen, there's a reason why we're called to confess our sin to Christ, but then even as a church, we're called to confess our sins to one another because we're called to pray for each other. We're called to care for one another. We're called to walk along, alongside one another, to carry each other's burdens, to even restore people who were caught in sin. That is the grace of God. That is a gracious invitation of God even this morning. Perhaps you're a believer in Jesus Christ, but there is sin that's affecting your life. It's the grace of God that has you here to say you've got to practice dying to yourself. And so often it's not done alone. That is why God gives us the church, the fellowship of believers, the joy to walk alongside other brothers and sisters, a place where we can admit that we're broken, that we still wrestle with sin. I still wrestle with sin. I still need accountability in my life. I still need other faithful men alongside me in my life to point me to Christ. And this is what we do as a church because there's salvation in no other. So let me pray for us this morning. Heavenly Father, God, I pray that that would be a true reality for each and every one of us, that we have been dead in our trespasses and sins, but now we are practicing dying to ourselves. We are walking out this road of sanctification, Lord. I pray that even the reality of that affirmed over us again, preached to us this morning, Lord, would help us with all, with all seriousness to pursue this, to take it seriously, to know that we must die to ourselves and live by the power of your spirit. But Lord, I pray that you would spur us on with the joy and with the hope and with the happiness that there is in doing that, that Lord, you promised that you came, that we can have life and have it to the full and have it abundantly. And so you don't call us to come and die and, and live a life of just miserable sacrifice, but you call us to awesome, joyful, wonderful hope of the gospel, that you give us your Holy Spirit, that you give us your, your church that you bless us in so many ways, ultimately because we've been spiritually reborn and we look forward to our greatest blessing, the hope of your return, the hope of being with you forevermore. And so Lord, I pray that we would truly be able to say that we have accepted the glorious news of the gospel, that we would come to the cross, we would die to ourselves and live for you, and we would count it all as gain this morning. I pray this in your name, amen. Stand together. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my riches gain I can.
If you have any questions about what you heard today, there'll be uh, Pastor Scott will be up here, and uh, John will be up here as well. Any prayer or anything like that, we'd love to pray for you. And I uh, know that you are loved, and uh, hey, if this is your last weekend up at the cottage, thanks for joining us this summer, and we'll see you next summer. <laughs> God bless your love.